So this ancient recipe, it wasn't super specific. It said two bunches of stinging nettles, some venison, and a cup of barley. So, uh, ooh, I'm feeling that sting. Should I wear gloves? They wouldn't have had gloves back then. Should I return to the spoon? Hey there, I'm Sola El Whaley, and this is Ancient Recipes with Sola. In each episode, we take a dish you may recognize and attempt to recreate one of the oldest versions of it to ever exist. So it's a little cooking, a little history, and a whole lot of me. What's not to love? All right, in this episode, we are going back further than we ever have before, beyond ancient Rome, beyond Stonehenge, even beyond ancient Egypt. Yes, we are going back 8,000 years, all the way to the Stone Age, to recreate the oldest recipe ever. Well, maybe we think so. It's like really, really old, so we're gonna go with it. What we are gonna make is a type of nettle and barley pudding. Now, you know the ancient recipes deal by now. This pudding is nothing like an American pudding. No, and also in Britain, the word pudding is used differently than it is here in the States. The way they're using it here is meaning anything boiled in the gut, like sausage or haggis. So this recipe is really just a boiled ball of weeds. So the recipe that we're making today is based on one that a group of researchers worked on in 2007 when they were trying to learn more about food history in the UK. So they combine archeological evidence, um, a little experimentation research to get to this. And it's basically a lot of greens. So these are herbs that they would have foraged back then. And they're gonna all go into this pudding. Here we've got some sorrel, which is a really lemony, tart, bright green. It's really different whether you get young sorrel or old sorrel. So when it's nice and tender, you can just eat it like a salad. And when they get older, they're a little bit more tough, but they cook down really tender. So it's a lot like kale or collard when they get older. We've also got some stinging nettles here, which are named that because they have these little, they're almost like little needles that prick you and drop little bits of histamine into your skin so you get super itchy. But don't worry, as soon as you apply a little bit of heat, that stinging ability, it just goes away. And the great thing about them is they're super nutritious. They do kind of taste like spinach and much like spinach, they're very high in iron. There's also gonna be chives, which we know and love. Everybody knows a chive. Dandelion greens, which dandelion greens have been used like forever. They're pretty much everywhere. And the cool thing about them is you can eat all of the dandelion green. You can eat the leaves, you can eat the flowers, you can eat the roots. People roast the roots and make something that kind of tastes like coffee, but with no caffeine. They're gonna add some nice bitterness here and they're super nutritious. Half a cup of dandelion greens have as much calcium as a glass of milk. And some watercress. Watercress is related to wasabi and mustard, so it's gonna be nice and peppery. So even though it's a bunch of greens, there's a lot of distinct flavors happening here. We've got, we've got the bright acidicness, the bitter, the peppery, the oniony, and the spinachy. So I think that's gonna be great. So this recipe comes to us from the Mesolithic era where people were starting to get into settlements and do a little bit of farming, but people were mostly hunters and gatherers. So that's why we have all these gathered greens. So here I have some dry barley. We've soaked this barley overnight and now I'm gonna crush it. This is gonna really help bind everything together. Because otherwise it's really just herbs. Another dish that the Britons ate around the same time that you'd find this one is hedgehog with cinnamon sauce, which I don't even think I've seen a hedgehog outside of Sonic. There was a bread made with barley that was found in the later Stone Age, so it is possible that they would have had that bread with this meal. Gif went off camera to smash my barley. All right, so now I'm gonna chop up some venison to mix in with my barley and herbs. They probably didn't have knives, right? Stone Age, they would have just smashed, but you know, I've done enough smashing for the day. I'm gonna do like a tartare mince here. Nice and fine, chop it up. And then this is gonna get mixed up with everything else and then we're gonna boil it. Okay, so I'm gonna give this a nice chop. This is really nice, lean venison. I think it's gonna taste pretty good. So far, like everything in this, I have no problem with barley. All of these herbs are fantastic. Who doesn't love venison? 
The thing that gets a little scary is when we put it inside of the beef bun. They might have used a stomach. We tried to find a stomach, but we could not find one. But I think that they might have used like a sheep stomach or a, a lamb stomach. I don't know. Did they have lamb back then? A smaller animal, not like a cow or an ox, because they have very large stomachs. It's almost like this is a precursor to haggis. Haggis. A lot of people give it a bad rep, but I think it's pretty delicious. You take all of the innards of uh, rabbit or sheep and you mix it up with some oats, some seasoning, and you boil it inside of a stomach. And uh, I don't know, I think it's good. If you like black pudding and stuff, oh, do you know what black pudding is? That's the sausage that's made out of blood. It's also delicious. I, I think that I may be into this. I'm getting a little excited talking about all of the stuffed puddings I already know about. But funny thing, so in England, the word pudding, yes, it can mean something stuffed inside of a gut like haggis, but it also refers to any dessert with no creamy pudding vibes at all. You know, like stiffy, sticky toffee pudding. In America, that's a cake. In England, that's a pudding. Uh, what are other English dessert? Mince meat pie? They call that a pudding. Here it's a pie. Everything's a pudding over there. You know, this is already looking really good. I would season that up with like a quail egg, a little mustard, some mustard seeds. I think that would make a really good tartare. Okay, we're gonna continue our smashing, our folding, our chopping. Gif went off camera to smash my barley. And he has returned. Okay, so now I guess we're just gonna mix it all up and shove it inside of a beef bun. So there's, you can get different kinds of thick, thicknesses, widths, no. You can get different widths of sausage casing. So like uh, when you see a really skinny um, merguez, that's a sheep's casing. A little bit bigger, you got hog. Beef bun is the biggest one around. That's like reserved for mortadella. So this is gonna be a honkin' piece of pudding. Okay, I feel good about that. And I'm just gonna plop this right into my barley. Let's throw this guy in there too. And we shall begin to mix this up. In here, I've got my barley, I've got my venison. Now I'm gonna add my herbs. So here are my peppery dandelion greens. You can probably find these in your own yard. And if you do really get in there, and eat them because they're delicious. Watercress, nice. They definitely would have had a lot of things with watercress. Watercress is also one of these things that's just like all over the place. And ah, the lemony tart sorrel it just perks everything right up. The fancy restaurants have made sorrel really cool so it's easier to find, which I'm really happy about because I love it. Now our stinging nettles, everybody's going in and a little bit of chives. And I'm actually gonna get in here with my hands and knead this. I think that's, that's what we need to do. We'll bring it all together. So this ancient recipe, it wasn't super specific. It said one bunch of dandelion greens, one bunch of watercress, one bunch of sorrel, two bunches of stinging nettles, some venison, and a cup of barley. So, uh, ooh, I'm feeling that sting. Should I wear gloves? They wouldn't have had gloves back then. Should I return to the spoon? Perhaps, it's prickly. Okay, I'm gonna mash. I would use gloves today, but they definitely didn't have that. I imagine that they just like had a couple of rocks that they smushed this around in. Oh gosh. Okay, we switched to a bigger bowl. And I'm gonna keep my hands out of this. I don't know who would be like, this thing really hurts my face, let's eat it. But you know what, they did. And it's not a bad thing because it's super nutritious. You know what I think would be funny if we did like a call and response and I was like, this recipe is so old. How old is it? This recipe is so old. How old is it? Stonehenge was being erected in 3100 BCE and this recipe is 3000 years older than that. Huh? Okay, okay. All right, this recipe is so old. How old is it? 
It dates back to the Mesolithic era, where most people were hunters and gatherers and just eating weeds and tubers. Okay, how about another one? Okay. This recipe is so old. Back when people were eating this, they even had harder teeth for all the tough things they were chewing. I don't know, that wasn't great. Um, I just need to mash a little more and then we're stuffing it and we're boiling it and we're eating it. It's all gonna happen. Okay, so now it's time for the fun part. This mixture is gonna get shoved inside of this beef bung. Beef bung is the polite term for beef intestine. Delicious, delicious. Okay, the last time I worked with this stuff was in culinary school. So uh, we'll see how this goes. We, we went with beef bung because we couldn't find the stomach. And because it is the biggest of the casings, the largest in the casing family, it should be the easiest to stuff. But uh, where do I begin? <laughs> I'm going to, you know, I'm going to just prep it a little, you know? So we can ease our way inside. Maybe let's uh, use this spoon to get us going, you know? Whoa. I got this. Okay. <laughs> Delightful. This is how they make sausage. So that's why this was easy to find. We still use this stuff today. Don't get grossed out. You've eaten beef bung, probably, and you don't even know it. Now, what's crazy is archaeologists have found human remains in that Great Britain area that go back 500,000 years. But because of ice ages and freezing tundra climates, people haven't actually been able to settle there permanently until 9,500 BCE. The nice thing about this beef bung, I gotta say, unlike sheep's casing, it's sturdy. It is like, it is not uh, ripping on me. I was afraid of it like ripping and tearing, but we're doing okay. We're doing okay. Ugh. Oh boy. Ooh, you know what else happened during the Stone Age? That's when we started to find people using pottery, you know, clay pots and stuff for storing and cooking food. They actually found some fragments of pottery in China that go back 20,000 years. So yeah, man, people have been cooking in pots for a long time. This does not smell good. Can you smell it from over there? <laughs> oh yeah, oh, okay. Oh. This is when everybody turns off. We just need them to watch 75% of this video to get the view, so we'll just start this after 75%, you know? Oh. oh, gosh. I haven't torn it yet, which is exciting. I wonder if I should take this beef bung home for my own projects. <laughs> what else can we shove inside of here? <laughs> Is that going to be the merch? What else can we shove inside of here? It's so sturdy, I am shocked. But you know, back then when they were hunter, <laughs> hunters and gatherers, they like had to track this animal down, get together in a group, throw rocks at it until it died. You're not wasting any part of it. You're going to use that beef bung. Okay, I think I've got enough here. Let's begin. The stuffing. Oh, come on, buddy. <sighs> okay, that was exciting. All right, I'm gonna trim it right here. And we're gonna stuff that much of it. That feels like the size of a sheep's stomach. Okay, here we go. So I'm just gonna start shoving stuff inside of here. You know, I feel like this beef bung could make a great, like, ancient purse. It's very sturdy. You could keep your stones in there. Oh, yeah. How many times can I say beef bung today? It is so sturdy. I am so impressed. I did not know there was something made inside of an animal's body that was this tough. Cows, you know? They give us leather. They give us beef bung. I think beef bung purses is going to be the future. We should uh, 
get the trademark on that. So I think I need just a little more. Sorry guys, it'll be over soon. I mean, I don't know why I'm apologizing. I'm the one that's touching it. <laughs> okay. This seems like, I mean, this is a really smart way to like cook your food, you know? You can mash up a whole bunch of stuff and turn it into something nutritious. This, regardless of how this tastes, this is gonna be super nutritious. I mean, we've got lots of vitamins and minerals from our greens. We got protein. We got collagen from that beef bung. People nowadays pay for a lot, pay a lot for like packets of collagen. He could just eat beef bung. That's what it's made out of, collagen. Okay, I think this feels good to me. I'm gonna tie this baby up and then we're gonna simmer this until it feels nice and firm. I'm not totally sure how long it's gonna take because this is not a recipe I've made before. But you know, ancient times, I don't think they were looking for like precise temperatures, like mid-rare. They're probably just cooking it until it was cooked. So that's what I'm gonna do. Okay, so if you are gonna do this at home and you don't happen to have beef bung or stomach lying around, you can just take this same mixture and tie it up in a sturdy fabric, like a few layers of cheesecloth or muslin and then try the same thing. Cause I actually think Regardless of uh, how the beef bung looks or smells right now, I think this is gonna be tasty. All right, we are gonna tie her up and then let it simmer. You know, right now, it's just a nice little sausage. Big sausage, big honkin' sausage. You know, some people say that cheese was invented because they put milk inside of a sheep's stomach to store it. And then that's where they discovered rennet. Rennet comes from the lining of a sheep's stomach and that's the stuff that helps milk coagulate and become cheese by accident. They were just trying to, they just made a little water bottle, you know, for their milk and then boom, cheese. One of the greatest inventions of mankind. Okay, we did it. Oh, it was a journey, but we got there. So now that I've got my bung all tied up, I'm gonna toss it in some boiling water and cook it up. We can toss the old bung around. Hey, that's not terrible. <laughs> okay, all right. So here is our beef bung. It kind of plumped up during the simmering, but that sturdy, sturdy bung held it all together. I think Okay, so what's crazy is it had like a really funky smell when it was raw, but after cooking it, I kind of just taste, or I kind of just, after cooking it, I kind of just smell greens. You know what I mean? Almost like a spanakopita. <laughs> you know what I think is kind of cute? Doesn't that look like an Audi? <laughs> like a belly button? Okay, I am gonna slice into this bad boy, but like, I don't know, maybe back then they just ate it like a hand fruit, right? Just walking around, yeah. eating your nettle and barley pudding. Ooh, slice is nice, huh? Huh? Come on, so far. Surprising. Okay, we have to do a very dramatic reveal. You guys ready? Hey, that looks pleasant inside, okay. Okay, when I cut into it, I get more like cat food vibes. But I think that's the venison being cooked for so long. Venison does have a tendency to get gamey when you cook it for a long time. We tempt it the internal temperature of this because, you know, we have the capability to be food safe, so we're going for it. And it, it cooked to 180, which is very high for venison. But, okay, gotta say, when you get a beautiful cross section like that, that's kind of cute. I guess it's time. There's no more stalling. The texture is really nice. It just slices really, really well. A lot like a blood pudding. Um, I'm going for a small cube. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna start small. Okay. First thought, 
it's bland. It needs a lot of salt, but it tastes like it would be delicious. I mean, I get a lot of like the long cooked greens. That's the like first flavor that comes through. The flavor of the venison isn't even that strong. It's more barley. It's very, very barley forward. I'm getting, I'm not getting any like specific green. It's just like combo of greens all together. You know, like when you make a um, cuckoo sabzi or, you know, a spanakopita, that's kind of the vibe I'm getting. Or even like long cooked collards. But the venison is more just a texture and it's just really greens and barley. It's not that bad. Once you get past the idea that this is inside of this beef bun thing, it's actually, it doesn't taste that bad. It's really just barley, lots of greens, and then you get the texture of the meat. Um, I think that if you were to like sear this up, get it nice and crispy on both sides and add a good bit of salt, this would be perfectly delicious. I mean, would I make it again? Maybe, but I wouldn't go through the trouble of getting the beef bun. It doesn't really add any flavor. It's more just like, looks cool. But I think you can make this inside of like a cloth and then it would be perfectly delicious. But um, hey, what a surprise. I was not looking forward to this one, but it ended up pretty good. I guess they wrote down these recipes for a reason. If you liked what you saw today, be sure to like and subscribe and hit us up in the comments if there are any other ancient or vintage recipes you want to see me try out and I'll see you later.